Well, no doubt some of you took in at least some of the Shepherds Conference this week as likely upwards of 4,000 pastors, men from churches descended on Grace Community Church in California and were fed through many sessions, including one that was delivered by our very own beloved pastor. James preached on Wednesday night on, on persecution. And, um, and then, as I understand it, was summoned to Pastor John's office after and was told that he'd be preaching on Sunday as well. <laughs> and so while we're about an hour ahead of California, um, he will be up not once but twice preaching to the multitude that will assemble at Grace Community Church. And so please do hold James in your prayers this morning. And not only him, but those men from Grace Life here that are returning, They're, some of them are, are in the middle of trekking back currently as we speak, and others are staying for this Lord's Day in California, and then we'll be traveling back shortly thereafter. No doubt we look forward to hearing the reports from these men. I was reminded of how I had the opportunity to sing in the men's choir. As we sang, just the men here a few moments ago, um, listening to the men sing in, at the Shepherds Conference and thinking back to my time there, it was just a wonderful opportunity to serve those, those pastors from all around the world and uh, to lead, lead off the conference in singing in that men's choir was just uh, something I'll never certainly forget. Well, the Shepherds Conference is now in the past. It's history. But for our purposes this morning, I'd like, you, I'd like to take you even further back in history. I'd like to take you to a moment in 1924 to a very specific day in the day uh, in the life of Eric Liddell, one of Scotland's greatest athletes, now, you may know or have heard of Eric Liddell. Many books, many movies have been written about his life. Liddell first became famous for his athletic prowess as a runner. Later, he'd be known as a man who, serving as a missionary to China, would give his life for the cause of Christ. But it was in July of 1924 that Liddell traveled to Paris to represent Britain in the Olympic Games. It was discovered that the preliminary heats for the 100-meter sprint and the 4-by-100 four relay would be held on a Sunday. Now, these were Liddell's strongest events. And although he was under pressure, no doubt, from teammates, and from country, he quietly and definitely decided that he would not compete on the Lord's Day. But instead, he turned his focus to the 200 and 400 meter races that remained. And on Friday, July 11th, the 400 meter final took place. And as Liddell went to the starting point, an American athlete slipped a little piece of paper into his hand. Liddell opened the note and read it. It was a text from 1 Samuel 2.30, which reads, Them that honor me, I will honor. And that day, Liddell established a new 400-meter world record time. That slip of paper gave him a strength to run as he had never run before. Now, no doubt it's easy to get caught up in Eric Liddell's feet in that world record and to be able to attribute that to his devout faith in Christ, that devout faith having carried him along that day. But for our purposes this morning, and as will be in Philippians chapter 3, I'm far more interested in the actions of that unnamed American athlete who slipped that piece of paper into Liddell's hand, whose like-mindedness and actions are a vital piece of the events of that day. 
No doubt that unnamed individual was himself faithfully pressing on toward the goal of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. And he recognized the immediate need to spur his brother on in the race, holding the same convictions, living by the same standards as did Liddell, and ultimately that he would run to the glory of God. And so I'm impressed with this unnamed person. I'm impressed with the way he came alongside in that moment to encourage and to strengthen Liddell in no doubt what was a very difficult time. Now, I invite you to turn to Philippians chapter three. If you're not there already, Philippians chapter three. This morning we'll be in verses 15 and 16. And what I bring this morning could be considered the second part to last week's sermon, Onward and Upward. Although this morning I've titled today's sermon, Pressing On Together. Last Sunday we noted three essentials evident in Paul's life that determined, really that informed the way Paul ran the life, the Christian life. And we saw in verse 12 that Paul's true and honest assessment was necessary in order to run that race faithfully. He hadn't yet come to know Christ fully as he desired. He admitted that. And he hadn't yet been fully conformed into Christ-likeness, that with a moral and spiritual perfection that he desired. In fact, he confessed his current state of imperfection And so Paul looked ahead to his future glorification in that moment in the letter. And then in verse 13, we heard Paul express that singular resolve that he had, that one thing, setting his eyes firmly on the finish line while straining toward it wholeheartedly with full effort and vigor. And then in verse 14, Paul described that unswerving ambition that he held. He continued to move rapidly and decisively toward his objective, that objective being toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. And so in verses 12 through 14, Paul drew the attention of the readers to his own life's example. This is the way he lived. Why? Well, he drew attention to his own life's example to first confront the air of perfectionism that was trying to infiltrate the church. See, I said last week that he was being polemical when he wrote, he is confronting error. But then secondly, to provide the Philippians instruction on how they themselves were to live. But we need to notice a subtle shift that takes place between verses 14 and 15. In fact, between verses 12 through 14, and then that shift that begins in 15, we see that he's writing in the first person singular in those first three verses. But then afterwards, he shifts to the first person plural. He goes from speaking about himself, I, to speaking about himself and others, let us. This is important because this then shifts the spotlight from the individual to the collective, to the corporate body, to the church. And that's why these verses are so instructive for us this morning. Let's read our text, and I'll begin in verse 12, as I did last Sunday, and read through to the end of 16. Not that I've already obtained or have already become perfect, but I press on so that I may lay hold of that for which I was laid hold of by Christ Jesus. Brethren, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet, but one thing I do, 
Forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let us, therefore, as many as are perfect, have this attitude. And if in anything you have a different attitude, God will reveal that also to you. However, let us keep living by that same standard to which we have attained. This is God's word. And this morning from these verses, verses 15 and 16, I submit to you that Paul is providing readers with two further corporate essentials for running the race of the Christian life. And he does so that we, grace life, can understand how to run collectively with success, how we are to run the race so that we might win while spurring one another on. And if you're taking notes, the outline is pretty simple this morning. It's two parts. First, we'll take a look at the unified attitude that's presented in verse 15. And then secondly, we'll take a look at the steadfast standard in verse 16. So that's the unified attitude and the steadfast standard. Let's first consider the unified attitude necessary for pressing on toward the goal. I draw your attention to verse 15 again, where Paul writes, let us therefore, as many as are perfect, have this attitude. Now, anytime that we come across the word therefore in the word of God, I would hope that it would serve as kind of like uh, flashing yellow traffic lights, that we would take time to slow down and consider what has just preceded and what is about to be said. Because therefore indicates to the reader that there are inferences that are going to need to be made based on what Paul has just written in verses 12 through 14. Let us therefore, as many as are perfect, have this attitude. Well, first let's let's consider who Paul is speaking to. Who is he writing to? You'll notice the single Greek word there that's translated as many as in verse 15. This is referring to a quantity or to a group a specific group of people. And that group, Paul characterizes as perfect, as perfect. This is a a Greek term that means to meet the highest standard. But we would then immediately have to think back to verse 12 where Paul wrote that he had not already become perfect. Perfect. He didn't see himself as perfected or completed already. And so what does Paul mean here by referring to this group as perfect? Well, we need to approach this with a little bit of a different nuance. Teleos, as it's in the Greek, can mean perfect, can mean complete, but it can also mean mature. And so it carries an idea of maturity. We see this in other places where Paul uses the same word. We see this in 1 Corinthians 2 and verse 6 where he wrote, Yet we do speak wisdom among those who are mature, a wisdom, however, not of this age, nor of the rulers of this age who are passing away. And so here he's referring to the mature as being genuine believers those genuine believers who were, in fact, being taught by the Holy Spirit. These were the mature. In 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 20, he writes this, Brethren, do not be children in your thinking, yet in evil be infants, but in your thinking be mature. And so here he uses the term to bring across the idea of maturity being accompanied by discernment. There's a sense of 
having an ability to be discerning here, the mature believer. Now we have to remember the Corinthian context, right? Theirs was a, they lived in a wicked, wicked culture. And that wicked culture was influencing people in the church. And so Paul certainly had to write them and point out the difference between being children in their thinking and being mature. But he also uses this same word in Ephesians 4 and verse 13. You'll remember how Paul wrote how God gave to the church apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. And this, he gave, these, he gave to the church for a very specific purpose, for the equipping of the saints, for the work of service, to the building up of the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God. But then he goes on to a mature man, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of of Christ. And so the character of Christ is represented in the lives of those who are mature. Again, in Colossians 1.28, where he writes, we proclaim him admonishing every man and teaching every man with all wisdom so that we may present every man complete in Christ. That word complete could be rendered mature in Christ with the character of Christ-likeness, being able to demonstrate that. Now, the writer of Hebrews uses this term as well, but solid food is for the mature who, because of practice, have their senses trained to discern good and evil. And so again, the mature carries with it a sense of the ability to discern. And James also uses this term in 1 and verse 4, he writes, and let endurance have its perfect results so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. There he is again referring to a maturity, a Christ-likeness. Again, in chapter 3 and verse 2, James writes, for we all stumble in many ways. If anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man able to bridle the whole body as well. And so with maturity comes an ability to live in a manner that is in accordance with walking according to the calling to which one has been called, being able to bridle the whole body as well, that there is a self-control, an ability to live in obedience. And so Paul here in our text is referring to the spiritually Mature, But we can even glean further evidence of this idea of maturity from the Greek Septuagint. In the Hebrew, tamayim means ethically sound, to be ethically sound, to be upright in character, referring to one's integrity. And we see a sense of maturity demonstrated as a number of individuals are described in this way. Genesis 6, 9, Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his time. Noah walked with God. Describing Noah being yoked to God. There was a integrity, a blamelessness, even a, a maturity that he had as he enjoyed a very close relationship to God, with God. Deuteronomy 18, 13 where the command is given, you shall be blameless before the Lord your God. There's a nuance of living in godliness here, striving for personal holiness, walking in obedience to God's law. This again would describe the mature. 1 Kings 8 and 61. Let your heart therefore be wholly devoted to the Lord our God to walk in his statutes and to keep his commandments as at this day. And so these are ones whose hearts have been turned to God and they are persisting in that. They are keeping themselves busy with walking in his statutes, keeping his commandments. Now there's a contrast that can be seen in 1 Kings 11 and verse 4, which reads, for when Solomon was old, his wives turned away, turned away, 
Rather, let me begin that again. For when Solomon was old, his wives turned his heart away after other gods, and his heart was not wholly devoted to the Lord his God, as the heart of David his father had been. And so I use that to draw one additional fact here when we're talking about those who are mature, those who are blameless, yet they are not without sin. Blamelessness does not mean absolutely sinless. And so still having the ability to sin. But rather, blamelessness serves as a disclaimer against all fellowship that one would have with wickedness. Even Job, we see, confessed his sin before God while at the same time expressing his wholehearted commitment to God and to walking in his requirements. And so let us, therefore, as many as are perfect, have this attitude. He's speaking to the mature. Now, which attitude are are the perfect to have? Which attitude are these mature believers in Philippi to have? The CBS renders verse 15, the first part of it, this way. Therefore, let all of us who are mature think this way. Have this attitude is equated to thinking this way, but thinking in which way? Well, Paul mingles some sincerity here with some irony, okay? And so you'll have to, you'll just have to hear me out on this. To the genuinely mature, he calls them to continue sharing in his way of thinking, acknowledging his imperfection and together with everything else that appears in verses 12 through 14. This is the way they are to be thinking. Not that they have obtained it already or have already become perfect, Understanding that Christ has laid hold of them, but they haven't yet fully laid hold of Christ, and yet desiring to press on, reaching, striving forward, forgetting what lies behind, this is the way they are to think and certainly to press on toward that goal. But while he speaks with sincerity to those who are mature, mature, there's a bit of an irony here as well because those who are adopting perfectionism are also reading this very same letter. And to them, he exhorts to think opposite, to, to actually think opposite of that, to not see themselves as being perfect, but rather to see themselves as he himself saw himself. Not that I have already become perfect, Paul says. And so this is the way they are to think. They are to be thinking in a way that truly and honestly assesses themselves, to have that singular resolve to stop looking at the past, but to be striving toward what lies ahead. And then also to have an unyielding ambition. And that unyielding ambition would be toward the goal. Would you agree with me that Paul is calling on the believers in Philippi toward a steadfastness when he says this, to remain steadfast in this? I think this is exactly what he's doing. But there's something else that we need to notice here as well. He's calling them to something else in addition to steadfastness. He's calling them to unity, to unity. And I would say that apart from the theme of joy that is so abundantly obvious in his letter to the Philippians, I would say that unity is the major theme of Philippians. I would say that unity is the major theme of Philippians together with joy. And I want to show you this theme from verse 15. And so when Paul exhorts the Philippians to have this attitude He uses a word here that he uses a number of times in this letter. For nomen is the verb. It means to think, to be of a certain opinion about something specifically. And Paul uses 
this same word in other places, directly related words derived from phreneo. He uses this elsewhere in the letter. And so this is going to help us to better understand exactly what he's driving at here in verse 15. Consider Philippians 2 and verse 2, where he writes, Make my joy complete by being of the same mind. Phreneo. This is, this is that term. And so he's calling them to a unity of mind, that the brothers and sisters in Christ would be unified together with the same minds to really, literally think the same way. But then again in Philippians 4 and verse 2, if you look over there, where he urges these two women to live in harmony in the Lord. Now he uses phrenane, which is again a derivative of phreneo, and it means to be unified in thinking. The way you view things needs to be the same. This is what he's calling them to. And we need to understand then that in Philippians 4, 2, when he says live in harmony, they cannot live in harmony unless they first are seeing things and understanding things the same way, that they need to think the same way. They need to be like-minded before they can then live in harmony. And so Paul is primarily calling for a unified mindset here among the, the mature believers in Philippi. And we have already seen that that unified mindset includes that we have not already obtained we have not already been made perfect. We have not yet fully apprehended Christ. We must admit the evidence in our lives is, as undeniable proof of that. But at the same time that Christ most certainly has apprehended us, we must not pride ourselves in the past, but we must always be reaching forward. And ultimately, we must Press on toward the goal of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. This is the unified mindset that he is calling them towards. It's really, it's really singular in focus when we think about it. I'm, I'm reminded several years ago, 10 years ago or more, I had the good pleasure of knowing a young man who was engaged to be married. And he had come from Boston. He had ended up at a seminary in Manitoba. And after I got to know him, I found out by way of a phone call that he was in the hospital with a very rare form of blood cancer. He was only 32 years old. Engaged to be married, his, wi his wife-to-be, I should say, flew in from Boston and sat at his bedside. Sorry. Sorry. And as she sat there, and I sat there as well, she shared with me the single most important promise they had made to each other. She told me that they were going to spend their lives together pushing each other toward heaven. And she did. She fulfilled that promise. Is that you, Grace Life? Is that your desire? To push each other towards heaven? Every opportunity given, whenever we gather together, when we have fellowship, is that your desire to see others pressing on, right? Even taking the focus off of yourself, but putting it on the other and wanting to encourage that person to push on toward the goal. You know, many of you sit here with your loved ones. Are you encouraging them to press on? Are you doing this daily? Others of you sit not too far away from others that you share some very deep and profound relationships with. Are you, are you urging them to press on? Are you exhorting them on a regular basis to keep their eyes fixed on Christ? I think this is what Paul certainly is desiring to see among the believers in Philippi. And so he gives them 
this exhortation. Let us, therefore, as many as are perfect, have this attitude. And if in anything you have a different attitude, God will reveal that also to you. You see, there is more that can be mined from verse 15. There's more to it. If in anything you have a different attitude, God will reveal that to you also. Paul here clearly anticipates that some will think otherwise in the church. And when some think otherwise, obviously unity will come under strain. Now, certainly in the church, although there are mature, we have not yet already been made perfect. We have not become perfect. And so no doubt there are those of us who may be looking down our noses at others who are struggling with sin. And in that moment, we take the eye, our eyes off of the main thing, so to speak. Or there are others who choose to die on hills that are not worth dying on. It's like I'm going to stick my own personal agenda somewhere into verses 12 through 14 here. I'm going to add to that. I'm going to make other things important as well. Personal agendas can easily run contrary to pressing on. But I need to have my position heard on this. And so even if it causes turmoil, I'm just going to say this. That certainly is present in the local church. There are, other, there are others in the church who just simply don't share Paul's same attitude, the attitude that he expresses in verses 12 through 14. Now, we need to know that if there are those among us that do not hold to that same attitude as Paul presents in 12 through 14, we ought not to condemn them. Right? We ought not to condemn them. Why? Well, we see at the end of verse 15, because God will reveal that to them. He will cause something to become more fully known to them. And so let's leave that work then to God. And we can certainly pray as we leave that work to him. Is there a a better one to leave our differences with than with God, to bring those things before his throne of grace. We know that God is at work, and so it's all right to leave our differences with him. We see God at work very specifically in Philippians 1 and 6, where Paul writes, for I am confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. There's an ongoing work happening in the lives of believers, and certainly God can easily reveal such that, uni that there would be a unified um, presence within the body, that we would be same-minded. But then again, in Philippians 2 and verse 13, where Paul writes, for it is God who is at work in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. In fact, we know that he continues to be sovereign over our sanctification. And again, he can easily reveal to those who hold a different attitude that they ought to be corrected and come under the same attitude to have that same attitude that Paul presents here in this pericope. And so let's pray. Let's pray that God would reveal a proper attitude at the proper time where needed. But then there's also an underlying attitude that needs to accompany this very way of thinking, and that being an attitude of humility. Humility is required among us with each other. We see this in chapter 2 and verse 4. Regard one another as more important than yourselves. Again in verse 5, not looking out for your own personal interests, but also for the interest of others. And in verse 6, this being the very same attitude which was also in Christ Jesus. So we've got the, the remedy for differences. 
We know that we need to exercise humility in the face of differences and waiting upon God as he brings unity into the church. What's the result of thinking differently? What happens when we do not think this way? Well, certainly disunity will be present. There will be an inability to live in harmony as we've seen in, ver- in chapter four and verse two, where there, they were, he was commanding those women to live in harmony. If we think differently, we will not live in harmony with each other. And ultimately then, the main thing will not be the main thing. I'm borrowing that from Pastor Lyle. I listened to his sermon on this very text this week. And so he titled his sermon, The Main Thing, calling verses 12 through 16, the main thing in Christian living. We are to press on, but if there is difference in thinking, then there will not be that pressing on that needs to take place corporately, together in the church. And so what we've seen here in verse 15 is that unified attitude that is essential. It's essential for pressing on toward the goal together as brothers and sisters in Christ. But let's also then consider briefly here the the second point that Paul makes, that being pointing to a steadfast standard in verse 16. Take a look at the text, verse 16. However, let us keep living in that, by, the, by that same standard to which we have attained. Now in verse 16, Paul breaks away really from verses 12 through 15 because he desires to emphasize something that's really important here for us. The text could read like this. In any case, let us keep living by that same standard to which we have obtained. But notice also that Paul's not using an imperative here. So this isn't a command that he's given, giving. Rather, Paul is beseeching readers. Let us, he says, let us keep living. Paul places himself under this very same ethical demand that he's urging others to continue in as well. And he uses a a very interesting word, actually, in the Greek to bring this point across. Stoichain is the way it's pronounced, and it is a military term that literally describes being in rows, walking in line, marching single file to battle. But here he's using it metaphorically, really to describe how we are to be walking by the same rule. We're to be in line with what's considered the standard for one's conduct. And so there's a sense of conformity here that Paul is describing. The same standard that we are to keep living by. He uses this term in other places as well, and it's helpful to Think of Galatians 5.25, where he writes, if we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. Walk according to the same rule by the Spirit. And again, he uses this term in Galatians 6.16, where he writes, and those who will walk by this rule, peace and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God. Talking about how... One is to walk in line according to a specific standard of conduct. But what is this standard that Paul has in mind here? What's the standard? Well, it's that very same standard to which they've already attained, he says. We know that the Philippians are already following Christ. They're Christ lovers. They They have given themselves over wholeheartedly to Christ. And we see this in many places, actually, in this epistle. We see this in chapter 1 and verse 5, where they're described as participating in the gospel together with Paul. 
We also see in verse 7 of chapter 1 how they are partakers of grace together with Paul in Christ. And in Christ, they are praying on Paul's behalf according to chapter 1 and verse 19. This is their, their love for Christ and their love for Paul has caused them to be praying for his ministry, even as he is in chains. Again, in chapter 1 and verse 29, we see that because they are followers of Christ, they suffer for the sake of Christ, and this being a grace gift from God. There are other examples as well, certainly the sending of Epaphroditus to Paul so that he can minister to Paul, meet his needs, to be a messenger, to bring news of the church to Paul. Certainly, this is all clearly demonstrating their, their love for Christ, their allegiance to Christ. And these then display that the body is attaining to a maturity of faith that's mentioned in verse 15. They are successfully achieving that standard of conduct. And it's a standard of conduct that's really aligned with Paul's. They're walking in lockstep with him, even as he himself is exhorting them onward. And so the Philippians received Paul's beseeching. And they received it, as we see here from chapter 3, they received it together with his life's testimony fresh on their minds. No doubt they were thinking back to verses 7 and 8. But whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ, more than that, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them but rubbish so that I may gain Christ. This is calibrating the believers in Philippi. And so we've seen these two corporate essentials for running the race of the Christian life together. Ours must be a unified attitude. And also, ours must be a unified standard. There's no room outside of that. Now, I think there's one other thing to be mindful of here. And that is that Paul's letter, from Paul's letter, and certainly from verses 15 and 16, we can understand that the local church is a mixed company. We're a mixed bag of nuts, maybe. We could describe it that way. The church, the local church, is comprised of many people at various places in their walk of faith, right? Various levels of maturity, so to speak. But not only that, the local church includes pretenders, those who are not walking with Christ, but trying to give the appearance that they do. And so within the church, there are those who are solely, wholly sold out for Christ. There are those who are pretending. There are those who are very mature. And there are others who have been in the church either for a short time or for a very long time, but have grown very little in their knowledge of Christ. Now that presents a problem, but I think the solution is right here in verses 15 and 16. We need to be spurring one another on. And so I ask, are you helping others to mature? Are you in a position to help others to mature? Or are you in need yourself of maturing? Are you urging others to be in the word daily, to be in prayer daily? Are you encouraging people in that way? Are you able to sanctify others through fellowship? Are you contributing to the building up of the body, to the edification of the saints, ultimately that others would be sanctified together with yourself, 
Are you pushing them on toward that goal for the prize of the upward call of, Christ, of God in Christ Jesus? Are you continually doing this? How often do you speak of the finish line with others? Let us, in our conversations, keep our eyes fixed on Christ, anticipating that, that finish line that lays ahead. One commentator wrote this about Philippians 3, 12 through 16. He says that it serves as an admonition to Christians of every age to be all the more diligent to make certain about his calling and choosing you and to maintain a healthy respect for that harvest day when God will purge all offenses from his field. It stands as a warning against every teaching that assures the believer so completely of salvation that it engenders complacency, spiritual pride, and moral laxity. Let that not be us. Let us be spurring one another on, encouraging one another to press on toward the goal. Now, certainly, we live in a society that loves relaxation, do we not? Love relaxation. In fact, I think a good and solid work ethic is in a steady state of decline. We see that in various places. And replacing that is entertainment and pleasure, highly valued in our culture. The life of ease is pursued by so many, but let that not be us. The Christian life is not a life of ease. Paul is our example. He's writing to exhort the Philippians onward and upward while he himself is in chains. That's, that's remarkable. His was a life of submission, a life of humble service, a life of obedience to the end. And no doubt, his life was just simply modeled after the life of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so the question is, are you modeling your life after the Lord Jesus Christ? I could even ask this, do you know Christ? Are you here this morning yet without a reconciled relationship to God? You have not yet met Christ at his cross. Well, in Acts chapter 17, we read these verses, verses 30 and 31. Therefore, having overlooked the times of ignorance, God is now declaring to, to men that all people everywhere should repent because he has fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness through a man whom he has appointed, having furnished proof to all men by raising him from the dead. Are you looking to, have you looked to that one who has gone to the cross, has paid the penalty for sin, died and then was raised three days later, ensuring that both the power of sin and death are defeated? Have you looked to Christ? If not, I'm calling on you to repent this day, to turn from your sin, to turn to Christ, to believe in his finished work. John 5, in verses 22 to 24, say this. This is Jesus' words. For not even the Father judges anyone, but he has given all judgment to the Son, so that all will honor the Son, even as they honor the Father. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and does not come into judgment, but is passed out from death into life. This can be you. You do not have to remain in your sin. If you look to Christ, to the forgiveness that is available through his work on the cross, you too can be saved. You too can inherit eternal life. Now, we've already read this morning from Philippians chapter 2 and verses 9 through 11, where there is mention of a coming day. We read how God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, 
so that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth. That is you, each one. But not only that, that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Not only will your knee bow, but your tongue will confess whether you are a friend of Christ or a foe of Christ. Every life will go to the cross. Every life will have its destiny determined by the cross. And so I would urge you not to remain an enemy of the cross as is described in Philippians 3 and 18, but rather to throw yourself at the cross, throw yourself at the mercy of God to repent and to believe on him. All have sinned. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And we know that the wages of sin is death. But we can be so thankful that the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. And that being the greatest demonstration of love, I would say, toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. There's nothing holding you back. Confess your sin, re receive God's forgiveness through Christ, and then have that certain hope of eternal life moving forward so that you too can press on, press on toward the goal with a unified attitude with those sitting around you and certainly with a steadfast standard. Let's pray. Oh, Father, what a wonderful encouragement you've given to us through the pen of Paul here. As we consider not only our independent task of looking toward Christ and pressing on toward the goal, but God, we are called to, you have called us to urge others in that same manner, in that same direction. And so, Father, if we've been lethargic in this task, Father, we pray that you would put, put fresh wind in our sails, Lord, in our conversations as we enter into times of fellowship with our brothers and sisters. Let us speak of that finish line and let us eagerly anticipate being ushered into the very presence of Christ, the one who has died for us. Father, thank you for this morning. We pray in Christ's name, amen.